One of the games I absolutely loved playing on PS2 as a kid was The Sims 2. See, although I knew what The Sims was, I didn't have a computer strong enough to run anything better than Mall Tycoon 3 back then. And even then, only barely, because my stepdad didn't let 8-year-old me use the family computer out of a fear that I would get kidnapped or become a YouTuber or something. Come to think of it, I don't know how he knew what a YouTuber was when YouTube itself didn't exist yet, but he's dead now, and I think he'd be proud of me. I miss you. So consider my surprise when years later I picked up one of The Sims games on its original PC home only to find out just how different the real games were to the early console counterparts. Where The Sims 3 and 4's console releases are pretty much just straight ports, even calling the PS2 era games ports would feel like a disservice because these were completely different games designed from the ground up with a console experience in mind. Most notably, they had their own guided sort of story mode, a lengthy and handcrafted, almost role-playing game if you wanted to see what an RPG would look like if it was made by somebody who hated RPGs, that would take you through several pre-built houses with their own roommates, problems, and goals for you to achieve before moving on to the next one. Between 2003 and 2007, six console Sims titles were released, one every 11 months on average. These are The Sims, obviously, the console-exclusive games The Sims Bustin' Out and Herb's Sims in the City, The Sims 2, The Sims 2 Pets, which, yes, was a completely different release based on the PC game's Pets expansion, and finally, The Sims 2 Castaway, another fully separate release based on the PC game's, well, Castaway expansion, except on console, this was turned into a completely different game, more of a survival game than a traditional Sims one. Now, most of these Sims titles had handheld releases too, on GBA, DS, and even the N-Gage for some reason, and these two were completely different games from even the console ones, making the rabbit hole even deeper. My buddy Mini-Me covered the GBA Sims games a few years back, so I'll link his video at the end if you want to sink further into madness when you're done here. First, let's look at the weird and fascinating world of the Sims games on console, the behind-the-scenes stories of development hell and cancellations that led to any of these games even happening in the first place, and the story modes that made these versions of The Sims so unique. The initial pitches for a console version of The Sims took place pretty much immediately after the first game launched in February 2000, with publisher Electronic Arts wanting to capitalize as quickly as possible as they're known to do. However, for a few months, discussions took place as to whether to make a simple port that would have to be scaled back due to hardware limitations, or to design from the ground up a new, catered experience for console players, the kind of unique spin-off franchise that could even incentivize double-dip purchases from some buyers. The the idea of having a spin-off series of The Sims, which itself was obviously a spin-off of SimCity, was pretty appealing to EA, so by autumn of that year, a game titled The Herbs had begun production at Studio Maxis for the PlayStation 2 and Dreamcast. Uh, well, kind of. See, The Sims Machine was already barreling forward at fast pace, having become the best-selling PC game of the year 2000, with the game's first expansion, Live in Large, already on pace to be the second best-selling PC release of that same year, despite only having released a month prior to the Herbs starting production. The team working on this console spinoff was apparently pretty understaffed, and that only continued as the new Sims expansions would continue to take precedence. In March 2001, the second Sims PC expansion was released, alongside the reveal of a game called Simsville, which would attempt to cross over the worlds of The Sims and SimCity by giving you an entire neighborhood of Sims to, uh, well, lightly control. The reception to Simsville was not very kind, as it turns out giving Sims even more autonomy to ignore what you want them to do isn't very fun. In a pretty big blow to this still-budding series, Simsville was cancelled in September 2001, only six months after its initial reveal. Some of the Simsville staff was moved over to SimCity 4, others were moved on to producing more Sims expansions, and ideally at a faster and faster rate, and while Simsville's ideas and legacy did end up influencing the future of both franchises, in the short term it meant that the Herbs completely stopped production to focus on more profitable ventures. This halt in production came immediately after production had just begun on the Xbox and GameCube versions of it. So, the herbs sat in limbo as we entered 2002, and EA was starting to get antsy at the lack of money entering its gullet. In February of that year, the publisher contracted an outside developer named Edge of Reality to develop a different console port of The Sims, and they gave them 11 months to do it. 
In early January 2003, the PlayStation 2 version of The Sims hit store shelves, with the GameCube and Xbox versions releasing a couple months later, and obviously the Dreamcast version was cancelled, since the Dreamcast was, uh, well... Now, before we talk about the story mode of this game, things get a little weirder. After seeing this console Sims game's early performance and being impressed and liking the money entering its gullet, EA turned back around and re-kickstarted development on the herbs, while also taking Edge of Reality's Sims console engine and putting together a second Sim console team at Maxis to develop a direct sequel to The Sims and do so in only six months' time. Yeah, rather than contracting this sequel out to a capable developer that had just proven itself with the first game, EA further splintered the already understaffed Maxis so that they were working on two different console Sims games at the same time, alongside The Sims 2 for PC, several Sims 1 expansions, SimCity 4, The Sims Online MMO, and also Spore. The Sims Bustin' Out somehow achieved its six-month development turnaround, releasing in December 2003, only 11 months after The Sims PS2, and only nine months after the Xbox and GameCube versions of that first game. With this second console Sims game now on store shelves, and apparently doing a good job of flying off of those shelves, the Bustin' Out team split up and moved either to help finish up The Herbs, or to begin production work on The Herbs 2, even though The Herbs wouldn't yet release for another year. Now this part is apropos of nothing, but I need to share it anyway to show you that EA as a company has always been the way that it is today. By the time The Herbs released in November 2004, four deluxe editions of The Sims 1 had released on PC, those being The Sims Deluxe Edition, The Sims Double Deluxe, The Sims Mega Deluxe, and The Sims Triple Deluxe. Wait. In other words, The Herbs, the first console Sims game, ended up releasing third, and despite being intended to be a highly merchandisable spin-off franchise, it ended up coming off as the black sheep in its own series thanks to its two younger but now older brother games outshining it. Even a weird Black Eyed Peas tie-in couldn't save this game. After selling about half of its expected 5 million sales goal, The Herbs was dropped after release, never to be acknowledged again outside of making fun of it in The Sims 2, where your sim can find it as buried treasure and then angrily stomp on it. The Sims 2's console version, by the way, is the very same project that the cancelled Herbs 2 apparently morphed into, developed by much of the same team. Does your brain hurt yet? Mine does. Okay, with the messy history of these games out of the way, at least for now, let's go back to that first Sims PS2 game, the only one developed by an outside studio. While at its most core level, it's very clearly taken a great amount of inspiration, or just assets from the PC game, the three most noteworthy changes here are a much smaller build limit to hold to the memory limitations of the consoles, some quirky little two-player minigames, and the Get a Life pseudo-story mode. Instead of just giving you a plot of land and saying, go nuts, the game starts up up by straight up telling you to get a life. That's the only mode you have upon starting up the game. So let's create our sim. I'm gonna name him Dave. Dave Kazuma. Yeah. It's, uh, it's at this point while trying to customize Dave that I learned that the PS2 Sims games don't really play well with the stable public builds of the PS2 emulators that are out there because the Sims customization and or the intro movies after customization always crash the game. So, so Dave's, Dave's dead like my stepdad. I miss you, Dave. I had to fiddle with some different emulator settings to troubleshoot, so Dave's brothers Jeremy and Evo Kazuma also met the same gruesome fate before I just gave up and downloaded the much less stable test builds of PCSX2, where the issues have already been sorted out, so I, I guess they're not less stable after all. I still didn't risk customizing my sim just to be safe, so the fourth Kazuma brother named Kenny with an eye looks exactly the same as the first three. If you're wondering why I wouldn't just go with actual hardware after running into a bunch of crashes like this, it's because The Sims 2 wasn't the only PS2 Sims game I played when I was a kid. I rented this one a couple times, and I still have it seared in my brain how disgustingly slow everything is. Most of my footage throughout this video is me playing at two to three times speed, and I'm not talking the game's two times speed where you can just hold down a button and speed it up as well. For my own sanity's sake, I cut my playtime in half or more wherever possible by letting the emulator run at double or triple speed on top of holding down the speed up button at pretty much all times. In every game after this one, it's not nearly as bad, but this one, oh boy, it takes two in-game hours to level up your skills by reading. That's two full minutes of just sitting there doing the very first thing that you absolutely must do in this game immediately, or else your character is almost guaranteed to be soft-locked forever. 
The game's story opens up with Kenny with an eye, Kazuma, being woken up from a pleasant dream by his mom, who's pissed off that Kenny sleeps on the couch until noon every single day. Hey, that's that's probably, that's probably pretty fair. While this first home is meant to be a breezy, I don't know, 15 minute tutorial level, give or take, it's actually the worst nightmare that Kenny with an eye will ever experience. See, in order to move on to the second of this game's six total levels in the Get a Life mode, Kenny has to complete all of this house's missions, which include things like borrowing 800 simoleons from mom, making food without starting a fire, fixing the TV, getting a job, and if you take more than three days to do all of these basic tasks, Kenny then also has to get the bills out of the mailbox and pay them as well. Completing each task unlocks some sort of reward for either the two-player modes or just more furniture that you can purchase to add to your homes in this Get a Life mode or your free play save files. The problem with this first level is that Kenny with an eyes mom is the absolute worst roommate I have ever seen in my life. I'm not talking just in games, I'm talking ever. She makes a habit out of grabbing a bag of food out of the fridge, eating three bites, and then throwing it on the floor before grabbing another bag of the same food out of the same fridge. She doesn't flush, she doesn't take out the trash, or I guess really put in the trash. She doesn't work, and she only ever complains about how the house is a mess, and it's all Kenny with an eyes fault because he refuses to clean or cook, even though he does in fact clean and try to cook. If that wasn't bad enough, she essentially doesn't ever sleep, and since this is an open concept house, that means that it's impossible for Kenny with an eye to get any sleep at all because she'll always be watching TV and waking him up no matter what. That is, if you've fixed the TV already, which is the first mission she outright tells Kenny to do when the TV breaks mere moments after Kenny first wakes up. This, folks, this right here is a trap. You would think that The Sims PS2 is, I don't, I don't know, a good video game where it teaches you mechanics in a healthy, organic fashion. If you go to fix the TV immediately, it sort of does teach you things, as you'll get electrocuted and your mom will give you the hint to read a book first to level up your mechanical skills. But if you choose to grab a book right away and study mechanics so that you can fix this TV, you've already set yourself on the pathway to inescapable depression. <laughs> Like with every version of The Sims, here on PS2 you've got a series of ever-fluctuating motive stats, covering your hunger, hygiene, energy, social, comfort, bladder, fun, and all of the cleanliness, size, and openness of the room that you're in. Keeping all of these stats in balance is the key to any good sim life. If you eat, you'll probably need to empty your bladder soon, and if you don't, you'll probably soil yourself and need to bathe yourself to get your hygiene back, etc. And if too many of these stats are closer to half empty, or worse, just completely in the red, you'll see your sim's overall mood begin to change. Right above Kenny's head, you can see that he starts this game with two little ticks in the green. That's good, that's healthy, or at least as healthy as one can be living in a house where they don't actually have a bed that they don't share with their mom. So, y you know. By the time that you've spent two in-game hours reading to get to mechanic level two, the first level in which you're able to quickly fix that television without getting occasionally electrocuted, Kenny's already down to one green. And by quickly, I mean it takes him another hour and a half to fix that TV. If your sim's overall motive level ever dips into that red side, they'll end up depressed, too depressed to study. In this particular version of The Sims, the balancing act between all of the different motives is just a mess, and it takes an insanely long time to get any one motive back to green, by which point two or more others have started to dip down. Oh, you're tired and want to rest in a bed for a bit to get your comfort up too? Kill two birds, one stone? That's a good idea. Too bad mom's watching TV so you can't sleep. Now you're tired, grumpy, and hungry so you eat, only you can't cook yet because you haven't studied cooking because you're depressed. So you'll either set the house on fire by trying to cook, or you have to eat seven snacks in a row and throw them away, and by throw them away I mean throw them on the floor only to pick them up and put them in the trash, take out the trash, then also throw your mom's floor food away because otherwise your room stat will tank and you'll never be able to keep yourself out of depression, then take out the trash again and order a pizza only for the game to be so slow to respond that your sim doesn't answer the door in time so the pizza guy takes your food and money and leaves with the pizza. In essence, if you try to complete the first three missions of The Sims tutorial in the order they're given to you, you're doomed to fail if you don't know any better because it's frankly impossible to live with Kenny's mom without her ruining his mental health. It takes a while mingling with her to get her to give him the 800 bucks. What the game tells you on the pause screen is the first main goal of the level, and if you do this one first, you're already screwed because you've wasted that valuable buffer time that the game gives you before your Sims emotions start to fall apart. If you focus on the television first, you'll level up your mechanical skill by reading, only to be electrocuted again at level 1, making you think that you should just keep reading to get to level 2. It's just a mess, and after trying to balance the tightrope that was Kenny's emotional health for a good hour plus, I realized that he was a lost cause, that I had failed him. So, like any reasonable person, I killed him and replaced him with his brother Leonard. 
Leonard Kazuma. The first order of business was to remind myself that this is a Sims game and use the proper Sims strategies, namely locking Leonard's mom in a doorless room for as long as possible while Leonard learned to cook and fix things. It still took a bit longer than I'd like, especially since this game rewards you with a bonus piece of furniture if you finish each level in the story mode in under a certain amount of time. Uh, in this case, it was 24 hours, and and boy, I poor Kenny, he, he spent a lot more than 24 hours there. But once the ball was rolling, I had Leonard pick up the very first job that came up in the job search, so our boys joined the army. Honestly, at this point, the game just becomes a slightly less annoying monotonous grind, but it's still very much a monotonous grind. The second house has you living on your own, which gives you ample time to bump up as many skills as possible for your career path before moving on, and your career path is usually one or two of the required missions to move on from here on out, so using houses two and three to your advantage is definitely the play. Managing your character's motive levels is so much easier once you're out of the tutorial, though. It's one of the most interesting tutorial difficulty spikes that I can recall, honestly. All you deal with in House 2 is fixing up the place and cleaning it up a bit, while the landlord's son Dudley shows up every now and then just to, uh, insult you for being poor. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of weird. Then you move in with him and start throwing parties to make more friends so that you can find a better roommate than Dudley and never talk to Dudley again, probably. And the last three houses after that task you with finding a romantic partner, having kids, sending those kids to boarding school immediately, and spending 20 grand to buy a yacht. Remember when yachts were only 20 grand? I don't either. I'll be totally honest here, I stopped partway into House 3, because I knew the rest of the grind really wasn't going to be worth it, especially knowing what we're in store for with the next game. It's cool seeing the little bits of gameplay evolution. Like once you move in with Dudley, for example, you can start controlling him to some extent. He won't clean or anything, but you can have him use the grill so that Leonard never has to waste time cooking, and Dudley will at least also pay the bills for you. But the trade-off is that Dudley is so lazy that you have to make sure he goes into work, because if he gets fired for missing work twice in a row, it's just like if you got fired, game over. Outside of the pure absurdity of the opening minutes, I don't recommend putting your time into trying The Sims 1 story here, especially since its sequel, Bustin' Out, may as well be a remake of this game. It's the same sort of tutorial, where you wake up from a dream in your mom's house and work your way through the different houses by way of life goals. Several characters even return, but mercifully, Maxis sped up the snail pace that Edge of Reality had implemented in the first game. Maybe that's a little symbolic, since they made this game on such a rapid, crunched six-month schedule. Bustin' Out also has a more dedicated story focus rather than literally just getting a life. Here, the landlord from the previous game, Malcolm Landgrab, is the game's main villain rather than just being your usual, you know, acceptable landlord levels of villainy. So your goal throughout the game is to get revenge on him for stealing a bunch of stuff from each of your houses by making enough money over time that you can buy his mansion from him and evict him. And that's exactly what Mahomes Kazuma is gonna do. Yes, I named him Mahomes. Why, you may be asking? Because I blew my load pretty early with all of the dead Kazuma Sim names, and I just, uh, I started throwing darts at the board here. The Sims Bustin' Out makes so many super neat little improvements, both at the surface level and subcutaneously. The kind of things that won't change the core experience, but that will add up to make this a night and day difference from The Sims 1. I mean, for one, you can turn off free will, which uh, also may be symbolism. But beyond that or the super fast skill level ups, it lets you revisit your old houses more easily, go back and forth between them to do different challenges at different times, depending on what you want to do, or you can just visit some neighbors in general by way of this masked loading screen where you drive from neighborhood to neighborhood. Some challenges will task you with going between neighbors' houses and yours to find a stolen item or to flip Dudley off because Dudley's back too, and this time around you don't need to complete every single mission in each and every house before moving on. In the same breath, when you do finish up missions, there are a ton more item rewards, or just more substantial cash payouts. Even better is that this game does a great organic job of teaching you how the whole, you know, building thing works. The items that Malcolm Landgrab steals from you are the items that you usually need for one of that property's missions, so it forces you to keep looking at where different items are in the shop and getting you to experiment more with what people would usually consider the more fun part of The Sims, rather than just teaching you how the actual Sims themselves function. Really, the only thing that makes this game a bit of a grind at times is your usual Sims grind, or your usual grind in life, maybe. Having to make friends. Since this was still a bit earlier in the series, it was sort of a crapshoot making friends in The Sims because you only have a few ways to dictate the conversation, although you do learn others as time goes on, like gossiping, which, surprisingly, pretty much always works. Well, that's not really that surprising, but, y you know. 
Like with most Sims games, you'll need to have an increasing cast of friends to continue getting promotions at work, but that's pretty easy to do here since you can get your job relevant stats maxed out with the snap of your fingers more or less. Where sitting down to study a book before would take you minutes upon minutes of real lifetime to get one individual level, here you can get from level 1 to 5 in the span of that same time, just about. But, I, uh... I forgot about the friend requirement since I hadn't really played The Sims in like 10 years, so even though the console games have the number of friends you need to get each promotion lowered, it did take a bit of grinding for Mahomes to get popular enough to move through his showbiz career. He, uh, he got stuck somewhere between game show host and sex symbol. With a voice like that, fair. It's like my Uncle Kagi once said, with great power comes great big booty bitch. Anyway, for a game put together in only a few months, not only is it impressive on its own, but then for it to be a game put together by a different team learning the original studio's work on the fly, and for it to be not only a playable game, which the first one couldn't really say at times, but such an improvement that it became a good game at that? I mean, hats off. It made me excited to see what they would have in store the following year with a full year of production on the herbs. And then I played The Herbs, and, uh, it's kind of just a worse busting out in every single way. Like, like, it's fascinating how this game turned out, considering that this was technically the Sims console game that started it all. I'm guessing at some point the idea morphed from a Sims apartment-styled game into, uh, well, this. Because there were already a couple Sims games out now ahead of this one, thanks to the development hell, and this one needed something unique to stand out, or, or something. I'm, I'm not really sure, but that would be my guess. The game opens up with a Sim entering what's supposed to be Sim City, traveling through the city by way of subways and exploring the nightlife, only to be bullied by this Pokemon trainer looking ass and denied entry into a club because her dance moves aren't on point. At which point, the actual Black Eyed Peas show up and help her show off her now more on-point dance moves. The same move that she did before, but she stuck the landing this time, so now she can enter the club. And then after that, when the game actually starts, Will I Am introduces you to his friend Darius, and then Will I Am is pretty much never seen again. Great. Darius sets you up with an apartment and teaches you the rules of this new city, although apartment might be a bit generous, he doesn't even give you a toilet, he just gives you a shower, a sofa, and a refrigerator. And that's... that's it. It's fine, you don't really use that apartment anyway unless you're trying to complete the mission to furnish it more to unlock a pet dog, who you then leave at the apartment anyway while you play the rest of the game and you pretty much never go back there, so it's probably better that you don't have the dog, I'm not gonna lie to you. I will say one cool thing about this game is that it lets you create four sims for the story mode. I'm guessing because this is the only real mode in this game, and this way you could have different siblings playing on the same file. The next couple sims games moved away from this back into the whole one save per memory card thing, which is really kind of disappointing. Now, that said, at first I thought I had to create four sims for my playthrough, so I named my first sim Lamborghini Kazuma, thinking that she would have siblings named Mercy, Yo Chick, and Thirsty. It, it, it's okay though, because my game crashed and then corrupted Lamborghini's file, so Mercy, <laughs> Mercy Kazuma took over anyway. What The Herbs does is sort of an evolution of that Simsville idea, and not too far removed on paper from what Bustin' Out aimed to do, with having multiple little houses in an extended sort of neighborhood. Here, there are nine different districts of the city, and as you unlock each one, you'll find that you have a really dingy bungalow sort of apartment so that you don't have to travel back and forth between your main home and the districts and watch the game load uh, a ton just to go to sleep. Every district has its own sims and its own style. There's a rooftop party area, a biker chop shop, a bustling city center, a dingy subway housing complex thing full of sims rocking the punk aesthetic, and it also has a fight club, which I guess is cool. Every area has its own very clear flavor is what I'm saying. What's more, you can pick whichever area you want as your starting turf, and from there you'll unlock the rest one by one. The goal in the herbs is to build up your reputation across each of these areas by befriending all of the sims, working at each of the unique jobs that each different area has, gaining entry into the super selective club that each area also has, and eventually b bullying a bunch of nerds that come in to try and ruin the, ruin the parties. Uh, let me go back a bit. As you complete each of the small task-styled missions in each area of the city, not too dissimilar to the goals in Bustin' Out or The Sims 1, you'll build up your reputation and local sims will start teaching you new social moves to better communicate with others. The whole name of the game here is socializing to build that reputation so that you can unlock new parts of the city to further build that reputation. And everything outside of socializing has been scaled back and simplified to its absolute most basic level. The game cuts down on the amount of motives that 
that your sim has, instead only having the five most important ones. Sleep, hunger, hygiene, bladder, and fun, and I guess technically you could say the social meter is still there, but it's now moved into a new reputation meter. If you don't constantly socialize with other sims, your reputation will start decreasing at kind of an alarmingly fast rate. All of these needs, on top of being cut down to just these 5 slash 6, are filled up so much more quickly than even busting out aloud, and that makes them feel less consequential and makes us feel a bit less like a Sims game. The game's also rife with product placement, from Verizon billboards to drinking Red Bulls to refill your energy meter pretty much instantly, meaning that why would you ever sleep because you can just drink a Red Bull? You should, you should consume Red Bull, is what this game is telling you. There really aren't that many of your usual Sims-type motifs past the very surface level. You don't really spend much time furnishing your apartment, since you're only really going to have to be in each area for maybe a half hour or so, unless you're going for 100% for some reason. Even your usual skills have been simplified down to three job stats, artistic, physical, and mental, each of which can only be leveled up with one specific item. Instead of there being ten levels per job, there are now only three, because you're going to be doing all of the jobs to beat the game, and I will say one neat at least on paper thing about these jobs is that this time around they're an active gameplay element instead of your sim simply disappearing for eight hours. Some of these jobs include being a sushi chef, running a biker chop shop slash sausage griller, they run a promotion that gives free sausages to their customers, honestly, really good business model, or wrestling and selling ferrets to the same, like, five sims over and over again out of what has to be an illegal rooftop operation. Now, when I say they're an active gameplay element, that's the whole on-paper thing. It's not really neat in practice, because they pretty much all have no meat beyond mashing the square, X, and circle buttons in a specific order. Even better, this may have been an emulation issue, I'll admit, but there was a bit of weird input delay that happened on only some of these, so while there's no penalty for messing up, it kind of makes an already bland process just a tad frustrating, too. Higher levels of each job add some sort of wrinkles into the mix. For the ferret salesman, for example, you need to mingle in between bagging up your ferrets once you get to level 2, so that the customers like you more and will thus buy, buy more ferrets? While you're actively working a job, it sort of becomes its own meta motive, where you've got to fill the meter all the way to green to get paid, and it'll fluctuate between green and red depending on how well you're producing the product in question while juggling your other stats. Gotta keep your energy up while fighting these ferrets, for example, or you've gotta wash your hands a bunch to keep your hygiene up while you're doing piercings. Since socializing with The Sims is the main gameplay loop here, you would hope that it would be engaging. It's not. It's not. It's not engaging at all. As you complete each area's missions for befriending that area's Sims, each of those said Sims will give you new skills like rapping to give you new ways of building rapport with other Sims. However, there's less of an on-screen indicator now of how close you are to actually befriending anybody, so you just kind of keep clicking on whatever conversation action is marked as green and then wait to see when the mission says it's complete. Once you've gained enough reputation, Darius will tell you that you've unlocked access to that area's club, but before you can enter, you've got to look the part. Since each area has its own clear vibe, it's also got its own clear bit of uh, clickiness. If you're on the rooftops, you've got to be dressed like what a bunch of white people think rappers dress like 20 years ago. If you're in the subway level, you've got to get a nose or really absurdly large nipple piercing and dress like what a stereotypical punk rocker would look like. It sort of makes everything else in the game feel superficial. Like, like, not that you're forging these deep bonds with any of these characters or anything, you're just making them watch you spit in your own mouth five times in a row, but it feels like since your only goal in this game is to build reputation, that you're just making your sim fake all of these different personas to fit in with each crew. Some folks won't engage with you at all if you're not wearing the outfit that they deem is cool. If you're dressed differently, you can't get into the club. It's weirdly gatekeepy. If I wanted to work my way through a bunch of weird, superficial clicks to get to the end of a game, I would play Bully. Or I'd watch the Warriors. Or, or I'd play sports. Big booty bitch. Anyway, once you've dressed the part, you can enter each of these clubs, assuming there's not just uh, somebody standing there on the other side of the door, unwilling to move, so you both just get stuck in a loop where you're both standing confused for a good minute, uh, unable to get out of the way so that one of you can enter the goddamn door. This happened several times to me. One time during one of my Sims jobs, which is just great since I could have been fired all because Becky here decided she wanted to get stuck right at my workstation. Once you get into the different clubs, Darius will usually show up around this point to give you that neighborhood's super special power social move. This is the move you'll need to bully away those villainous nerds trying to ruin each party. Do that in all nine districts, and you'll get the keys to Darius's penthouse, where you get to prove that you're the coolest person in all of SimCity. At that point, Darius just, uh, 
He kind of flies away, and the game functionally ends with you owning his penthouse suite, which, like the apartment he gave you at the start of the game, is also just completely empty. I feel like if you weren't already given a tiny, pre-furnished, essentially, closet in each area of the town, and instead if you had more room to decorate or whatever, the game would find a way to feel more... Simsy. But since you really only have the starter apartment and this endgame apartment to decorate, and since by the time that you're here, you've already done most of everything, it kind of feels a little hollow. Which, I suppose, is fitting, since this game is all about making hollow connections to a bunch of different characters. Why would they give you any sort of substantial Sims gameplay? It's easier to just take out most of the furniture that you could buy, hell, cut down on the money that you usually make to begin with even, and just focus all your time on the super engaging gameplay of selecting which way you want to talk to each person so that you can watch the same handful of animations over and over again. Even the little plumbob cursor is weirdly sticky in this game and harder to navigate in either of the prior two games. It's just not a fun game to control or play. If I'm being totally honest, and I'm not trying to be super mean here, I'm not all that sure what anybody involved with this game's production expected out of the herbs. There's nothing here that has the makings of a hit game, let alone the start of a spin-off's spin-off. I'm super curious whether this game changed so drastically throughout its production because those other Sims games came to console first, or if this was always the idea. I know that there are a lot of people that have a soft spot for the herbs, let's be real, most of them at this point because of the stupid and incredible Simlish versions of Black Eyed Peas songs, and I guess I can see some sort of kids market for this game where more traditional Sims gameplay maybe wouldn't have clicked with that same audience. That, that, that last part's a lie, actually, I don't buy that in a world where the first two console Sims games easily outsold this one. I think that this is simply a dud of a game that somehow made its way onto shelves, perhaps due to sunk cost, and simply hoping the Black Eyed Peas could somehow lift this one up. The one positive of The Herbs as it released is that, like I mentioned earlier, as soon as this game fizzled its way to launch, The Herbs 2 turned into a console version of The Sims 2. I was a little worried coming into this video that I'd be disappointed playing this one again, the one that inspired this whole video process from me, that my memory of this weird console version would end up being a little too rosy. And given, the game runs like total trash, but that's just like I remembered, actually. Otherwise, I still adore this version of The Sims 2. At its core, it's just a more polished bustin' out, featuring many of the innovations that the main version of The Sims 2 brought to the table, including things like wants and fears for your Sims. These are randomized sorts of goals that your sim wants to achieve, whether it's get a promotion at work, or have X amount of money in the bank, or do a cool surfboard trick, the sorts of things that harmonize extremely well with the rest of the 45,000 stats and sliders that you have to watch over on your stupid semi-autonomous Tamagotchi. And these wants and fears are both based on your character's life aspiration. You can choose whether your sim bases their life off of their love life, their popularity, their constant thirst for more knowledge, or, in the case of my sim, Joryu Jazuma, making a lot of money through shrewd business skills. Because Joryu here was focused on the money, his biggest fears were things like being robbed. These wants and fears will earn you or take away aspiration points, and as you gain aspiration points, you'll start unlocking new stuff that you can buy for your houses. Since this game easily has the most items and furniture of any of the games I'm talking about today, the aspiration points and the constant drip feed of little achievable goals is such a great way of gating and unlocking everything. I felt motivated to do as many of the little tasks as I could for each character character rather than them just going through the usual sims motions of working, eating, sleeping, crying, etc., and grinding at stat level ups in between. After three games in a row without the want slash fears mechanic, I completely forgot it was a thing, and as soon as I saw it again, I remembered how crucial it can be to keep these games engaging, at least for me. And to keep things flowing nicely, these desires can shift over time depending on if you leave them unfulfilled for too long, or if your sim sleeps for a long time and wakes up with a new short-term goal in mind. And in the case of The Sims 2's story mode, the top most of these wants will always be tied to your progression through the different houses, essentially using this new feature to replace the sometimes tacked-on feeling goals from the first three stories. These gold or platinum level wants are fairly static and tend to be a way of getting you accustomed to each property while forwarding your sim's career path. As you progress through the story, you'll move into a cute little beach house, a bed and breakfast that needs a lot of repair, a crashed alien spaceship, the usual, and sometimes your character's want will be tied to helping the other roommates achieve their own wants. Or conversely, in some cases, Joryu decides that a roommate looked at him funny and decides that he needs to make an enemy and an example out of said roommate. 
Great. But the neatest thing to me about this console version of The Sims 2 is also probably the least Simsy thing about this. With this game and the subsequent two Sims 2 spin-offs we'll be talking about in a bit, you can take direct control of your Sim using the analog sticks and run around rather than selecting specific actions with the little plumb bob cursor thing. Now you can also swap over to this traditional style as a way of queuing up multiple actions more efficiently, but I always enjoyed this personal touch even if it meant that I wasn't doing things in as optimized a way as I maybe could have. While you're in this direct analog control mode, your sim's free will is completely turned off, and you functionally are just playing the role of your sim. That can be a little frustrating in this one since this game is not nearly as optimized as busting out somehow. A good 40% of the time when you start an action up, like say lifting weights because Joryu suddenly wants to get buff, your sim will just freeze in place even though time is still passing. It's not a big deal in the grand scheme of things because I think the act of balancing all of your different motives is easily at its most balanced and fulfilling in this game compared to any of the others we're going to be talking about today, but there's just that inherent bit of annoyance that you'll always get without fail when something hitches up like this. It's like back in the day when Internet Explorer would freeze up all the time. Now, as you might be able to tell based on me not talking about the story at all, even though this is the first Sims game that actually calls it a story mode, this has the least amount of story to it, really. I misremembered there being a ton more here, but I think that's because back in the day, I did what you're supposed to do with The Sims and made my own little stories up between the different characters. Each new property does have a little bit of basic exposition at the start of the level, where you're taught the conflict that Joryu here is going to try to solve. It might be fixing up that bed and breakfast so that it's what the owner always dreamed it could be, or maybe it's getting the alien's neighbor to accept that he's living next to aliens instead of trying to fight them. They're all smaller micro-stories, barely really stories at all, but the same little bits of care went into having each property tell part of that story contextually. With the bed and breakfast, you'll have to fix up the broken stove, invest in new furniture to make it look nicer, etc. It's far less driven than become a millionaire to evict your mean landlord, but it really allows you to go through and experience all of what this console version of The Sims 2 has to offer. Offer. There's even a game-wide progression tracker to show you how many items you've unlocked, or how many of the job paths you've completed, or how many skills you've maxed out. There are secret bonus properties if you fulfill certain criteria in some levels. What I'm saying is, even as often as this game hitches up, and even knowing that the modern PC versions of any of The Sims games are going to be a better Sims game by any real objective measurement, I think that there's just some level of unique charm that makes this a game worth revisiting. This and Bustin' Out are really the only two that I would say that for, not to spoil the last part of the video here. And even if it does make for a worse gameplay experience in the traditional sim sense, I would really love to see this direct analog control make a return in a future game, or as a mod or something, help, it might exist for all I know. I've never been a huge fan of these life sim sorts of games enough to go in and create my own little perfect house or create a bunch of sims and just let them loose and do whatever, so having that ability to get a little more involved and to have that pre-built story path to give you a fun, lengthy showcase of everything each game had to offer, I, I know I'm the odd one out here, but that's the stuff that I ended up really liking The Sims for, only to find out much later that, oops, that's not really a thing outside of this specific PS2 GameCube Xbox era. Damn. I will say it sucks that in Sims 2, your free play mode and story mode are locked to one single save file, so you would have needed multiple memory cards if you wanted to do multiple things, which also, now that I think about it, defeats the purpose of that progression tracker. Huh. Oh, also, since EA caught the bug of including Simlish versions of actual songs, there's a Simlish Paramore song in this game. That's, it's not related, but you'll hear it playing frequently in the tutorial area, and it's, it's kind of, it's kind of funny. Now, I'm gonna brush quickly past the console version of The Sims 2 Pets, because this was, at the time, the closest a console sim game came to just being the PC game, or in this case, expansion. There's no story mode here whatsoever. You just pick a pre-built house and family, or make your own house on an empty lot, and get some pets for your sims to play with. It's... That's, that's the whole, that's just, it's just that, that's the game. I figured there'd be some sort of light story mode, or maybe even just Sims 2 story mode, but now with pets in the areas, but it's just a blank canvas type of game. You can control your Sims directly with the analog stick still, which is nice, but everything else that made the console versions of these games unique is just missing in this one, and this game ends up feeling a bit, uh, sanitized or even soulless in comparison. I named my town Commerce Cinco. That's, that, that's all I got on this one. 
Since there's not really a story to talk about, we'll move right on to what I feel has to be the weirdest Sims game, at least of the ones that I've ever played. The Sims 2 Castaway is, like I mentioned earlier, a console game loosely based on a different Sims Castaway experience called The Sims Castaway Stories, which itself was the final of a trilogy of Sims Stories spin-off games. Or, I guess more accurately, these games were developed in tandem because the console game actually came out first this time. This game is a survival game, taking a crew of player-created sims and crashing them onto a string of deserted islands. You can have up to six people in your crew, and these are the only people that you're going to encounter during the entire game. Well, besides monkeys that you can befriend. And corpses. I didn't know that there wouldn't be any other survivors by the time that I started, and I was kind of tired of making up different Kazuma names, so I had to make do with only the two people I, I randomized in this, in this uh, randomization selector. We have uh, Clunk Kazuma, and Dr. Kazuma. Her first name is Doctor, and she is also a doctor. Now, when I say survival game, I'm talking like hacking down bamboo, grabbing banana tree leaves, foraging for berries, slowly building up enough resources to build a rudimentary shelter, and a gradual progression of material types until you can build better and better shelters. The goal in Castaway is to explore each of these three, technically four, islands, eventually either building a ship to escape the islands, or putting together a homemade radio to signal an SOS. Along the way, your sims can find different books that have been left behind, presumably by the corpses, that add new quests or subquests to your adventure. It is so, so strange to see a sims game with this catered an experience. The islands, at least from when I tried starting a new run, were consistent each time. They were handcrafted with little secrets, hieroglyphs, remnants of a lost tribe, all this sort of environmental storytelling. As you travel between different parts of the islands, your clothes can get shredded by bramble on the pathways, and traveling between each different loading area actually passes up to several hours of in-game time. You can then make your own island clothing from different resources. There are a number of little huts that you can put together. You can set your sims to do specific jobs every day, like catching fish for the group or foraging, and all of this actually kinda matters. Like with every sims game, your characters can die, and there's a special potion in this case that can bring them back, but if all of your sims die, your game ends and you would have to start over or reload an earlier save. As unique as it is, though, this game is not very fun. Slowly building up resources and having to stop every five minutes because your sim got hungry or needs a nap is just frustrating, and although there are so many unique elements here, like being able to trap chickens or spear fish for food, or get your pet monkey named Three, I, I named him Three, to forage for you, it's not what I would call good. The inventory management is clunky to say the least. Some items you craft at a workbench, others you craft out on the open, but then you have to manually build it after you've already set it down to craft it. But wait, don't forget, you need a little nap! When it comes time to craft a raft to go between different islands, you can only do so at this weird ancient altar thing, and even crafting any one thing to begin with is gonna take you a long time foraging and watching your sims slowly cut stuff down. Thank God for emulation speedup, because this game's only behind the first one in terms of tediousness. There's not really as much emphasis on your sims socializing because, well, you might only have one sim alone, either by choice or because you accidentally killed and maybe ate them. I, I don't know that you can eat them, but I'm gonna assume you can. And your motives fluctuate pretty wildly in my experience since it expends so much energy and food doing even the simplest of tasks. It takes this game a good couple hours to get going because it's all just so slow. If any Sims console game could have used the split-screen gameplay that the first couple had, it is this one. Being able to split up and forage with your friends could have been super neat, but then, in the same breath, I fully understand that this game barely runs decently as it is, and having two people in different parts of the game would have been impossible. Still, even being able to forage on the same screen and cut down on the monotony would have gone a good way. From what I can tell, the two Castaway games aren't really related at all outside of the name and some asset reuse, so I'm kind of just left wondering why this idea got greenlit? Not in a bad way, just out of curiosity's sake. The answer is probably just that they could flip the assets into a quick console game rather than put all of that effort into just the PC stories release, but when I found this one during my early research, I thought maybe it would be like Survivor themed or something to capitalize on that show's constant rating supremacy during the mid-2000s. And honestly, imagining Sims arguing and trying to vote one another off a deserted island, that is a great idea. I would say I feel like I haven't scratched the surface of this game, even after putting a good bit of time into it, but then I know I was most of the way through the game because there are only three main islands and a fourth secret one that you unlock by solving a puzzle inside a volcano. Again, it's weird just to see that this game exists at all. 
This game has so many assets, animations, and concepts that as far as I recall have never been seen before or since in this series across all 7 trillion expansions, and yet it results in a game that's only really a few hours long, but feels much, much longer. It's uh, not the most satisfying game to end on compared to me gushing about how The Sims 2 held up pretty solidly against my nostalgia, or the wild story about how the first four of these six games owe their lives to the herbs in some way, but this one's definitely the most unique of the bunch. And that's kind of saying a lot, actually, because outside of pets, all of these games have something unique to them. And, I mean, pets has the pets thing, but unique to the console version. I mean, the first three are essentially console exclusive. Hopefully this little romp through one of the quirkier eras of an already quirky series was as fun for you as it was for me. It'll never happen, but I would love to see this era of more catered and, and honestly wackier Sims experiences return. Let me know in the comments if you feel the same way, or let me know why I'm stupid or something, I don't care. As always, until next time. Stay golden.